Welcome to the Peregrine Day, and this is Yangon, Myanmar. Welcome to Yangon! Yeah. I'm Rachel Parsons, and I travel alone all over the world to show you that traveling solo doesn't have to be so scary. And then being alone doesn't mean you're lonely. So come on. Don't wait for anyone to go with. The world is not going to wait for you. Don't be afraid. It's coagulated big blood. Ah. Don't be afraid. Be a peregrine dame. In the 1920s, Chilean poet Pablo Neruda wrote that Yangon was a city of blood, dreams, and gold. Then the country was known as Burma, and the city, Rangoon. Today, the former capital city of Yangon is at the epicenter of a massive political and cultural shift. Investment is pouring in and glittering towers are springing up between decrepit colonial buildings. Now, finally, a city more of dreams and gold than blood. I've landed in Yangon not knowing anyone here like usual, so I've decided to use one of my favorite couch surfing websites to connect with a few locals and a few expats who are here primarily as teachers. A local had offered to host me, but had to cancel after hearing about a law that he says prohibits Myanmar citizens from hosting foreigners in private homes. So I found an American expat living in Botetong Township on the east side of the city willing to host me instead. Not staying in a hotel is important to me for two reasons. I wanted to stay in a real neighborhood where locals live and some expats, people who live and work here. I thought it was important to see that when it comes to a city like this. You know, the other reason is purely economic. Because it's more expensive than other cities in Southeast Asia, so if you're on a budget, it's going to be tighter here than in other cities in this region. Except for Singapore. For a variety of reasons, accommodation in Yangon is just more expensive. So a very average room here is going to be twice as much. And sometimes it's not even as nice as an average hotel room. So I've made my shoestring longer by staying local. The thing that made me want to come to Yangon was frankly its political history. But I can't talk politics on an empty stomach, so I'm heading out to meet my first new friend. The city is easy enough to get around because the taxis are so inexpensive. There are buses, none of the signage is in English, they zigzag. So unless you or your friend can read Burmese, negotiate the rate beforehand and get in a cab. I've chosen to join my new buddy at Yatha Tea, a shop in the Muslim quarter in the city center. I chose Yatha because it's right in the middle of one of the uh, busier downtown strips. Makes it easier to connect with people. My name is Samuna. Uh, I study for the Yahoo. I work in shipping line. I graduate BS in chemistry. Yes. Zaw is indicative of what Yangon is becoming. A city of young, educated professionals who saw the end of the iron grip of military rule and like young people the world over, just want to have a little fun. When you go out with your friends, what do you like to do? Ah, uh, yes. I want to go outside with my friend, drinking. Drinking? <laughs> yes, drinking and dancing at the club. And dancing? Yes. You like dancing? Yes, yeah. I like yeah. dancing. Are there, good, are there good dance clubs in Yangon? Yes. Yeah. You go to all of them? Yes, I know the all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I could be sitting in many places on earth having a similar conversation, save for one big difference. How do you call the waiter? How do you, when you want the waiter, what do you do? You go. Oh, yes, just like, like that. That's how you call the waiter? Yes. <laughs> I know, in the States a wait person would spit in your food, but it's the norm here. It is baking outside, it's so hot, and the tea is hot, but it's so good that I can't really stop drinking it. The pastries, the samosa are all excellent. You order a tea or a coffee, and then green tea is served for free, so you always end up with, with far more than you pay for. It's, it's, it's one of the best things about this city. Okay, now back to why I wanted to come here. 
it's been about five years since the horribly oppressive, violent, murderous military government here that was in control for around 50 years relinquished some of its power and uh, since about 2010 some truly democratic reforms have taken place although there is a, still a lot of work to be done and even as I film this there are still skirmishes between police and paramilitary and students and the students in Myanmar have a long history of fomenting unrest and protest in support of democracy and democratic reform. Students like Jonathan, whom I meet when he strikes up a conversation in Mahabandula Park, not far from the tea shop. If Jonathan doesn't sound like a Burmese name, that's because it's his Christian name. Though Hindus, Muslims, and Christians are religious minorities in Myanmar, there are fairly large groups of each in Yangon. Buddhism is still religion of the land, generally. But in this city, anyway, there's a good smattering of everything else. There are Hindu temples, there are Christian churches, there are mosques, there is one, I believe, a synagogue. Although Jonathan's not too comfortable with the camera, he is happy to talk life and politics with me over a cold drink. He, like Zaw, is in his 20s and firmly supports the ongoing struggle for further democratic reforms. To be able to sit in a shop and have a beer and actually talk politics with people here openly and for them to volunteer information and for them to want to talk about it is a big deal. For many years travelers came through here and there was no way to, to talk with anybody about the things that matter, the really important things, uh, because you would get them in trouble. You could get someone killed if, if they would speak to you about it at all, which was pretty rare. So it's, uh, it's really, really nice to see and hear everybody um, openly discussing ideas. Remember, for decades, if the military government thought people were speaking against it, those people often disappeared. Here's a little primer. As World War II ended, after British colonization and then Japanese occupation, Burmese nationalists wanted independence. One of these men, General Aung San, a leader in the Burmese National Army, advocated communism. But he was assassinated by political foes in 1947. The building behind me had started as the seat of British government in then Burma. It was in this building, now called the Minister's Office, that General Aung San and six other allies were killed. The military would take outright brutal control of Myanmar in the 1960s and cling to that power for 50 years. By the late 1980s, the people had had enough. Led by what was to become the National League for Democracy, the major opposition, people slowly forced the military government to open elections and cede some of its power. While I'm all for dry history lessons, I suddenly have a better idea. Jonathan had mentioned working for the National League for Democracy. Not incidentally, the party is led by General Aung San's famous daughter, the Lady Aung San Suu Kyi, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. I try not to have too many of those, hey, look what I can do because I produce and host a TV show and you can't, yeah, moments. But this is one of those. My better idea is to swing by the Yangon office and have a chat. Not with the lady. She's a member of parliament now and far too busy. But the NLD spokesman and Aung San Suu Kyi's personal attorney, Un Yan Win, is happy to give me a little of his time. So I get to spend a precious few minutes hearing about the issues straight from the source. After the army take power, there are many uh, human rights abuses there. I was detained without trial for three years. For three years? Yes, uh, without trial. It's this kind of historic abuse that concerns the NLD when they see today's headlines. Government frees first batch of students. Activists and celebrities gather to denounce police crackdown. This month, still student protests. They're not killing anybody, but these peaceful protests have been broken up by, by violence from the police. Violence. I mean, it's still... They use the illegal force and they beat the women and men and the students and so many... And some hard. journalists. Yes, and yeah. journalists. I, mean, I suppose on one hand we can say, yes, there's been progress because no one died, but it's 
still, you know, they're still being repressed when they want to peacefully, peacefully demonstrate. The Constitution gives the right to protest. So you have the right to peacefully gather and demonstrate. Yes. It all reminds Mr. Wynne of the now infamous demonstrations in 1988. Then the government simply murdered people in the streets. In, in this period, everybody faced the uh, police force just before the 88. Similar to that, just before 88, they used the, the illegal force. So things are still things are still tense here. Yeah. Yeah. In the past, I know from 98 through the 90s into the 2000s, uh, the National League had requested a, tr a tourism boycott. They tourism didn't boycott. want people coming here because we didn't want money going to the government. Yeah, that because we said it's not the time to, uh, to, to, for the tourists right. to visit power. Do you think so, now, I mean, now is the time? Is it a good time now? It is, is a good time because the, they should know the situation, real situation of power and rural law or human rights abuses, so many things they, they have to If the international community knows that, um, we, we expect that the international community support for the activists, the democracy activists. Yeah. With all that in mind, it's time to go find the local international community. Though I'm so lucky to have had that time with Wynn, on the way I decide to attract some more good luck. You buy a bird for a thousand chow, and it's very good luck to release a sparrow. His little heart is beating very fast, and I'm scaring him, so I'm gonna let the little guy go. Oh, you ready? I feel bad for them all in that box. I think that's the point you're supposed to, but but these kids uh, are working in the heat all day, and, and if, it's a, if it's a buck to release a bird and, and give him a dollar, then I think that's worth it. <laughs> All this magnanimity is making me hungry. It's time for the food stalls of 19th Street. 19th Street is in Chinatown, but you can find equally good Burmese, Korean, and Japanese along this stretch. Just let your nose do its thing and it will guide you to whatever you want. What else could you ask for? The well-known stretch is the meeting place of choice for locals, travelers, and expats alike for cheap beer and exquisite food. The country's at the crossroads of the Indian subcontinent in Asia proper. Its scrumptious cuisine has been influenced by China, Southeast Asia, and India. I'm here to meet a couple of American teachers working in Yangon. My name is Jansen Kopp, and I am a humanities teacher. My name is Mark Cece. I work here as an international school teacher, teach social studies in high school. I've been living here almost three years. Having a group of people that's already here where there's no language barrier, uh, but who can help you navigate into the society here is really valuable. Even if they're not all thrilled to be here. Do you like Yangon? I would say I tolerate Yangon. It's, uh, it's a very interesting place to visit, um, full of interesting culture, interesting things to see. Um, it's not always easy, but it's definitely a special place. I do like Yangon, actually. Uh, it is, as Jansen mentioned, quite difficult to live at sometimes, but overall, it's a pretty good experience. It's very cultural. The people are amazing, as are the, the students that I teach. Even our waiter's a student. He says he's 15. It is the only Asian city that's got that uh, colonial vestige still here. It's crumbling and it needs saved. Um, but it's probably, I mean, there's a few other examples, maybe Hanoi, but uh, this city's got a lot of the I don't know, early 19th century architecture that sh has been destroyed in most places in Asia. You go around Yangon, you feel like you're going back in time. I mean, the people in tri shawls and the men with the longis and the women too, so conservative, it, it really is like stepping into the past a little bit. And they're just so authentic. They're not putting on a show, they're not asking for money because you're a Westerner. 
they are excited that you're here and they want to meet you and I really appreciate that. And I don't think that it's fake at all. It's really authentic. It's authentically easy to lose track of time on 19th Street. As a traveler, you'll almost certainly end up here at some point. I've saved enough cash crashing with my very generous local host in Bothethal that I've decided to move to a tonier neighborhood for the rest of my stay. The Tanwin Guest House in the Yankin neighborhood on the east side of Inya Lake is a quiet, relaxing little hideaway. I've got a bed in a four-person dorm. It is nice to have a mattress. Though the rate is more than I've paid for most private rooms in other Southeast Asian countries, the value is worth it. I can tell you this much, the Tanwin Guest House is without a doubt the cleanest, neatest, most well taken care of guest house that I've been in in the two months that I've spent in Southeast Asia. I would highly recommend it. I also like it here because the owners reach out to young people in impoverished country villages and offer them training and work they might otherwise never have access to. So I want them to give the opportunity to have the job and uh, to learn more and more English, to have their life better, mm -hmm. and to know more about uh, people from other countries coming here, and to exchange their culture, to exchange their experience, to exchange the uh, knowledge. This policy has allowed employees like Wu Win to continue her schooling while helping support her family back home. About a quarter mile away, on the south edge of Inya Lake, there's a more immediate example of the enormous socioeconomic divide. This is the home, the family home, of the Lady Aung San Suu Kyi, acknowledged leader of the democratic movement in Myanmar. And this is the home next door. It's a powerful illustration of how much work there is to be done here. Though if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't know it by the enormous towers going up around the corner. I find it very interesting that that marketing team chose to use the word prestige. In a nicer neighborhood like this, I get the feeling that the upper echelon here in Yangon, the, the really moneyed set, would probably like the city to eventually become something more like Singapore. If that's the case, they have a heck of a long way to go. But there's no doubt that money and investment are pouring into this country. The government's reforms of the past six years have opened Myanmar to substantial foreign investment. It's a welcome change after 50 years of economic ruin. But there's a domestic investment that I find more fascinating. The gold in Neruda's blood dreams in gold. Shwedagon Pagoda is Yangon's crowning glory. Perched on Singatara Hill in the middle of town, the Holy Stupa is a beacon for Theravada Buddhists throughout the region. Legend has it that a stupa has sat here on Singatara Hill for 2,600 years, give or take. What we know is this stupa dates back to 1485. It reaches 325 feet above Yangon. It is covered in 27 metric tons of gold leaf. The top portion has thousands upon thousands of Burmese diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and other gems. On the very top sits one 76 carat diamond. A stupa signifies that a holy relic of the Buddha or some other highly enlightened monk is contained within. It really is jaw-dropping. In the morning light, I can see those gems glittering on that umbrella. If you come in the evening, it's lit with spots that are strategically placed to make certain gems glitter and you can see certain colors as you walk around the stupa. Every four years, a call goes out for public donations to re-guild and repair the golden stupa. It's not unique to Buddhism by any stretch of the imagination for religious entities to have and hold large amounts of wealth in extraordinarily poor countries. This year's haul raked in nearly $30,000 worth of gold. We're talking about just millions of dollars worth of gold leaf and gemstones stuck to Shwedagon Pagoda in a country where many people, many people, can't afford to send their children to school. Incredible wealth stuck to one monument in one of the world's 25 poorest countries. Well, you know, if they melted it down, they could, they could feed and house a heck of a lot of people. Just some food for thought. 
Whether you're religious or not, the pagoda is important from a uh, from a historical standpoint and from an architectural standpoint when it comes to religious architecture in this region. It is breathtaking. It is a place of pilgrimage and worship, so it's important to be respectful, but know that if you're a foreigner, you're also going to be charged $8 to come in. Once you are inside, it's easy to kill half a day exploring scores of smaller altars and temples that ring the central stupa. Decor ranges from quaint to Liberace. You'll notice prayer stations labeled with the days of the week ringing the base of the monument. If you're so inclined, pick the day you were born and wash and pray to the Buddha at the corresponding station. While it's easy to fall in love with the charm of Buddhist rituals, it's important to know there's a dark side to Buddhism in Myanmar. A faction of nationalistic monks have successfully pushed the government to enact anti-Muslim laws, and many natural-born Burmese Muslims have been stripped of their citizenship. As far as traveling alone goes, I don't think you're going to have a problem at all. Uh, I certainly haven't. And I walk around with a lot of very expensive camera equipment hanging out all the time, everywhere, you know, thrown over my shoulder in my hand. The people, the younger people, the students who have a firm grip on English will certainly come up and, and strike up conversations. And that's a good thing. Uh, use your common sense, you'll be fine. Quite frankly, in this neck of the woods, you're just as likely to run into other solo travelers. Which explains how I've ended up at dinner with a guy named Ben. I met Ben, a fellow solo traveler, on 19th Street while I was waiting to meet Jansen and Mark. We decided to try some authentic Burmese food at Feel, a big family-friendly restaurant a short cab ride southwest of Shwadagon Pagoda. The menu is extensive and the food is scrumptious. The blend of Asian and Indian influences makes Burmese food some of my favorite anywhere. I don't know about those sour vegetables though. <laughs> Although we agree that the sour vegetables are an acquired taste. And that sauce was very, very fishy. Yeah. And everything else, yeah, oh my god. It's always a treat to meet another lone traveler because we almost all share the same views and values. I just love the way that people approach you when you travel alone. You know? And uh, it's just really easy to make new friends and meet people. You know? And I guess. Uh, when you're traveling alone, you also tend to be more proactive in, in seeking out people and meeting people. You know? so, uh, and seeking out new experiences, that's why I do it. Yeah. It's one of the best meals I've had in a very long time. I'm very full and I have so many flavors in my mouth that I can't keep them all straight, but every bit of it was just incredible. With all of that, I thought the food was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> Although I knew why I wanted to come to Yangon, until I got here, I had no idea what to expect from the contemporary city. I'd heard conflicting reports about everything from the reliability of the electrical supply to internet and mobile coverage. What I have found is a city that is uh, exploding might be a poor choice of words, but that's what it's doing in a good way. There is construction everywhere. There is technology that is increasing, becoming more complex and speeding up by the minute. There is bustle and movement and it's hot and a lot of it smells pretty bad. All right, the city does have some open sewer issues. You're gonna wanna watch that first step. But they're working on it but it's, it's a fascinating time to come and witness the changes firsthand. Because the pace of change here is ever increasing. A whole generation has grown up since the massive social shifts of the late 20th century. Technology and modernity have been enthusiastically embraced. 
although there are huge concerns around the future of political change. What do you want people coming to visit here? What do you want them to know? At this time, the situation in, about democracy and human rights is uh, nearly standstill. Uh, as a movement is stopped. But we are trying to move go on the transformation. Yeah. Some are working to save the colonial history of the place, while others are living only for now, at places like Vista Bar, where I'm very happy to spend my last night. It's been a very long time since I was actually out of the country on a trip for my birthday, and I am really, really happy to be able to say that I got to spend it this year in Yangon with a group of great new friends, locals and expats, and see the wide, very diverse, very rich fabric that is modern Myanmar. It's been a great trip.